Pow! What's up everyone? Eric Ross with the FBI here. Haven't been feeling that well. I'm still working on the Young Noah 560 Mark IV, Mark IV flash review. So come see that soon. I just wanted to shoot with it a little bit. But I want to just make a question and answer video. Haven't done one in a while, so that's why. Let's just dive into it right now like a swimming pool. So if you're well aware of what I do, then you know every month I do a question and answer, maybe one or two, whenever I feel like it. So I'll go around Instagram, I'll go around YouTube comments, emails, Facebook, whatever, juggle them all around, pick out some questions, and answer them live, well, live for me, not for you the next day, uh, type of thing. So let's dive into these right now. Once again, I just want to point out I'll be doing, because uh, it's very, very requested, the Yang Nuo uh, 560 Mark IV flash review. Stay tuned for that soon as well. Let's dive into these questions and answers. First question is from Devin, and what is the market for landscape and street photography? Is there a good way to make money? Well, of course, there is a market for basically any kinds of photography. It's just finding the right crowd. Um, street photography, it's a, it's a tricky thing. It's a lot of people, you know, like, I like to do it for fun. I mainly post a lot of my stuff on Instagram, maybe a couple things on website, but, you know, making money from it, essentially you're just maybe making a photo book, a photo story or something like that. Kind of like, um, Brandon Stanton, when he did Humans of New York, I have the book right here on my coffee table. Um, you know, so he turned that into a humongous thing and essentially it's street photography but he's telling stories of people through New York. Now there's been some other kind of knockoffs and other cities doing this. So there is a market for it. You just have to know how to target it. He built up a huge following especially on uh, Facebook with it and kind of developed it that way. So there is a market. It's very very difficult. Um, you know I guess you could sell prints and stuff like that but it, it is extremely difficult. What was the other thing? Uh, landscape photography. Landscape photography once again it's a very very niche um, market as well, but you know, uh, Trey Radcliffe, you know, he does a lot of HDR and stuff like that, but he deals heavily with landscapes and he's made a name for himself. But he notoriously, he gives away his information for free, uh, his, uh, his uh, work for free for the most part, for people to use non commercially and everything like that. So there is a market for it, um, but it is a passion for a lot of people. You know, people, you can make money from it, you can get hired. So my advice would be to develop your portfolio if you wanna go into those specifically, and who knows, someone might catch on, maybe a, a major corporation, like maybe a, just a Coca-Cola or something like that, might be like, hey, I like the way this, doing this landscape or doing this project in Japan, you know, something like that. So. I don't know if it can directly give you something 100% right of the way, but you can get something um, possibly, you never know, whoever sees your stuff. This is a pricing question from Steven. I've noticed people always have different kinds of budgets in regards to their pricing. Should I have a base charge, something that I always charge, or should I change prices per client? Great question. My thing is, and it all depends on what you're shooting, I, I feel a base price is the best way to go. A lot of people have packages that they like to do. Awesome, 100%, that's all right. Um, the way I like to do my work is I'm a custom rate photographer, so I'll give you the number I'm comfortable with at starting, and you can add on from there. Now, I guess you can, in, in a way, say that those are packages down the line, but I'm not necessarily going, hey, here's all the information up front, you know, everything like that, and maybe give options down the road, like, hey, how much would, you know, just a print be? I don't need 70 wallets, you know, to wedding clients and stuff like that. So, you, you do run a huge risk if you try to change per job, uh, especially in the same, you know, in the same field, because say if you do a wedding for one person and a wedding for another person and they were a recommendation of them and you charge X and Y couple 3000, but then you decided to give someone a break and charge 1500, you might catch some crap from that. So you have to be very, very careful with that. There's of course, there's different scenarios wherever you're shooting. There's a different market. Um, but keep that in mind. So, should you change per, I think you should be stable in the way that you handle your pricing. Just don't go too crazy. Once again, you can help someone out, but you know, try not to play dirty in that game. Sean asks, besides not including equipment, what is the newest thing to come in the field? Not including equipment. This is a very, very difficult question. I don't know if this will be a jump cutty thing or two, but gear is the way, you know, a lot of things are pointing towards like, you know, 4K video and all that kind of stuff. But I think the future is more or less relying on, I don't really know. I mean, this is a very, very hard question. I was debating just saying, I don't know. But um, because a lot of things are necessarily gear related in our field. So I would say it's, we are waiting to see 
another uh, artist, another photographer do something differently to make things stand out. Uh, what do I kind of mean? Kind of when Peter Hurley came into the game, a lot of people really got into headshot photography. Um, I'm just trying to think, uh, especially when Chase Jarvis started out, he really brought in the uh, the video background, the cinematography uh, form to the art, especially when he was one of the first to have the Nikon D90, which did uh, first HD video in a DSLR. So I think we're just, I mean, hey, if I could do it, trust me, I would. Um, I don't have the time or the resources and I don't know what to do, but I think we're waiting on the next big thing to really push the market. Now you might argue, uh, you know, people switching brands from Nikon to Canon and, and going to mirrorless or something like that. And I guess mirrorless, which I still think there's a two, I don't think it's even a debate. You're either mirrorless or your DSLR. They're not the same. They're two different markets and I don't think they're going to clash. The DSLRs aren't going to die. The mirrorless markers, uh, mirrorless cameras aren't necessarily going to take over. But I think it's going to take something big for another photographer, another creative person to come in and push the market in a certain way. Um, so I don't know. Hopefully I kind of helped you in that answer with that there. But anyone watching, what do you think, not necessarily gear wise, do you think will push this field? This is a very, very good question. Taverin, Tav Taverin, I'm sorry, I don't know if I know how to say your name. Uh, she asked, can you set up too much social media, AKA Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, Tumblr, Pinterest, Instagram, etc." You have to define where your thin line really lays. Um, so a sample for me, I do obviously YouTube. If you didn't say YouTube there, I don't think. Uh, you say YouTube, I do Google+, Twitter. Um, once in a while, I'll do Flickr, that's another one. Uh, Instagram, I do kind of weekly as well. And um, I think I said Twitter or something like that. So that is what I choose to be my creative outlet. Once again, why I do things the way I do, like a lot of my fun and street and all that kind of photography is more or less my Instagram, my Facebook's more or less professional sharing, commenting you know, with people, interacting with everyone. Uh, Twitter, more or less just following what's in the trends and everything like that, you know, I'll post on there as well. Flickr, if I have something good that I want to share or something like that. So really, I think that there is no such thing as too much. It's just what is too much for you mentally? I mean, because it is very, very taxing, I'll be honest with you, but I really enjoy doing it. Try to post four times a week, three to four times on an Instagram. Try to keep up with three or four videos a week doing YouTube and everything like that. And then maintaining and keeping up with relevant stories and everything. But if it's something you do, it's something you enjoy, it's your passion, if you want to do something with it, do it. Just, it is, what is the limit to you? You know, Facebook, billions of users, uh, Twitter, millions upon, maybe billions, whatever, I don't know their number of users. So you can get your thought out there. And if one person wants to listen, then holy hell, that is freaking awesome. So there is no such thing as too much. It's just what can be too much for you and kind of make the content relevant on different regards. As I said, my Instagram, I post a lot to Instagram of you know my daily stuff or some work and stuff like that because Facebook sucks with pictures. So I don't really share that 100%. So segment what you do. It's not too much unless it can drive you crazy. Like if something new came up that I had to do, I would probably pop my head or something. So it was a great mix of questions we had today. This is Eric Ross with the guy with the eyes signing out on that. Once again, if you guys, have, guys and girls have any questions or comments, please leave those down in, in, you know, in the comment below here or in any video that you do, email me, eric at ericrossi.com. Find me on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Uh, Twitter, you know, I definitely want to interact with more people on Twitter. There's only a couple of people who use Twitter a lot. So let's do that. Um, be happy to answer anything that I can. And hopefully these helped you out.